During the questions last week, uh, Linda Evans asked me about the collections of laws from the great civilizations of Babylon and Assyria and how they compared with uh, those in the Old Testament. And I said that this was the subject uh, next week, i.e. this week, and this is where I'm going to begin. In the second half of the 19th century and the first part of the 20th century, there were two great sets of discovery. In excavations in countries that we now call Iraq and Iran, thousands of inscribed clay tablets were found. While the clay was wet, they had been marked with a wedge shaped wooden stylus. These uh, tablets had then been baked and they were virtually indestructible. So we had the tablets with their writing on them uh, that we call um, cuneiform. And the next breakthrough was the decipherment of this writing system and there will be a little bit more about that later on. The decipherment of these tablets revealed the existence of two languages, Sumerian and Akkadian. Sumerian, a language that isn't like any other language that we know, apparently it's closest to Hungarian and Finnish, uh, was the language of ancient Sumer, Ur, Uruk, and those places um, in what is today southern Iraq. Uh, the other language um, in these tablets was Akkadian, um, that is ancient Assyrian and Babylonian, a Semitic language similar to Hebrew, Aramaic and Arabic, so a much better known language. And among the tablets discovered were collections of laws. And on the handout, under paragraph 1, I have mentioned some of the best known. I mentioned the Sumerian laws of Urnamu. You can say there, uh, we see there towards the end of the third millennium. Uh, Lipitishtar, beginning of the um, second millennium. The so called Middle Assyrian laws. And then the Babylonian laws of Eshnon. And above all, of Hammurabi, uh, the most probably the most important and best known collection of laws from the ancient world. And if any of you are interested, I have brought along um, a translation, well, the text and translation um, of the laws of Hammurabi uh, done by um, Godfrey Driver. And I mention, um, if you want to follow this up, the book by H.W.F. Sags, uh, The Greatness That Was Babylon, where he has a whole chapter on law and statecraft about these collections of laws. Now, one of the things that struck people looking at these laws was that they had quite a bit of material in common, and in some cases, material also found in the Old Testament. How had this come about? And two main theories were formulated. The first was that there had existed a kind of common pattern of law in the ancient Near East, and that where you have uh, Sumerian and Akkadian and indeed Old Testament laws with similar sort of material, they are drawing on this common pattern, this common heritage. The trouble with that is that laws don't exist in a vacuum. They need institutions, courts, lawyers, and that sort of thing. And so a more likely explanation for the existence of these collections and the similarities was that they were used as part of the training of a scribe and were texts that people copied out as they learned this trade of being a scribe. You couldn't become a judge or become involved in law without being able to read and write. And reading and writing was an extremely complicated business um, in the ancient world, and I need to say just a little bit about that to make that clearer. 
Uh, the earliest forms of writing, which go back before 3000 BC, um, and some of you may be able to see uh, the, the illustration on this book, uh, are really receipts for objects, um, fish, bread, cattle, and they amount to drawings on clay tablets together with little dots or notches uh, which give you the amount or the, n the number of fishes or, or whatever it is. Uh, and, and please, you're most welcome to come and, and have a look at this book afterwards if you're interested. It's about writing and techniques of economic administration in the ancient Near East. That was the first stage then of writing, uh, receipts for objects, and you drew the object in order to show what it was. But as the system of writing developed, there was of course the desire uh, to, to go further than this. And so an important change came about. A sign ceased to stand for a particular object, and instead stood for the word that you spoke if you were describing that object. And if I can use a corny example from English, let us suppose that we have this ancient writing system, and that we have a bee, the thing that goes bzzz, and a leaf, thing that comes down from a tree. So we start off with a picture of a bee and a picture of a leaf. But the next stage is that the, the picture of the bee stands for the sound, the word that we utter uh, when we say bee, describing the ghost bus, and ditto with leaf. And if we then want to write belief, couldn't really draw a picture of belief, you put together the sign for bee and the sign for leaf and you read that as belief. So you've got your system. There's only one trouble with this. No one has thought to invent an alphabet at this stage. This writing system represents syllables, B and leaf. And the trouble is that you need nearly 600 of these symbols if you are going to read and write. And although later on this system is reduced to something over 300, you still need to know that number of signs if you want to read and write. I've brought with me um, a, a copy of, of an Akkadian syllabary um, which lists about 330 uh, signs um, uh, that, that you would need to know if you were going to be able to read and write. That is, if you were going to become a scribe, and after becoming a scribe, you were going to go on to be a judge, an expert in the laws, because this is where you would get your knowledge of the laws from. And part of your training as a scribe would be um, the copying out of Proverbs, such as we get in the book of Proverbs in the Old Testament, um, and laws such as we get in the collections of laws, um, uh, including those that I've mentioned here. And one of the reasons, therefore, for the similarity in some of these collections of law is most likely to be that this is part of the education process whereby someone becomes a scribe and after becoming a scribe, an expert in the law and perhaps a judge. And one very important thing follows from this, and at the bottom of paragraph 2 of the handout, I have quoted an important passage from Sags. It's about six lines from the bottom of paragraph 2, where I say Sags summarizes an important conclusion of experts in the field. Quote, it has been pointed out, and then he's quoting somewhere else, there is not a single case in the thousands of legal documents and reports which have been preserved in which reference is made to the wording of the text of the laws of Hammurabi. And this is clear evidence that whatever the laws were, they were not statute law to be given a verbal interpretation, but rather incorporated principles to be observed 
or which actually had been observed in particular cases. Now, what he's saying is this. We've got these famous laws of Hammurabi. We therefore might expect, in the various legal tablets that have existed, people to be referring to these laws, you know, as, 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 as Hammurabi says, or as it is you know, stated in, in paragraph whatever it is of Hammurabi. No. As he says, um, there is not a single case in the thousands of legal documents that actually refer to the laws of Hammurabi. And so it is clear, as I say, that these were not um, statute law, but they, these were, were collections of laws, um, say, which say, possibly, as, as he said, um, incorporated principles to be observed, but they didn't seem to function um, as actual law. Now, in order to understand, I hope all that's been clear, um, but in order to understand the relation of what we have in the Old Testament to these other laws, we really need, and this is important in and for itself, to learn something about the history of the development of laws and collections of laws um, in, in ancient Israel, that's in the Old Testament. And so, under paragraph 4, I have um, four points. And I begin with what I call social mechanisms and give as an example blood revenge. Now this is something that is found in many societies in the ancient world and in modern societies. Um, I, mean, I mean particularly people, anthropologists doing field work in Africa in the 20s and 30s came across this. And it is a social mechanism which exists in order to be a sanction against people committing murder. You see, we're thinking of societies where you don't have a police force, you don't have detectives, you don't have courts, you don't have prisons, you don't necessarily have anybody administering justice. But you have these, I suppose they're sort of spontaneous, uh, social arrangements, and blood revenge is one of them. And it means simply this. If somebody in group A murders somebody in group B, then somebody in group B will take revenge on that person who committed the murder. And so if you know that if you kill somebody, that person's group is going to take it out on you, this hopefully will be a deterrent against committing murder. Now, in the Old Testament, there are some interesting stories that involve blood revenge and indeed show us attempts to take the, this natural social arrangement into the control of the state and the legislation. And among the examples I give under 4a, I want to say something about the story in 2 Samuel 2, and 2 Samuel 3, I've given you the references there, uh, that's the first line of paragraph 4. In the period after the death of King Saul, when there was a powerful struggle, the struggle for power between the forces of David on the one hand, and the family of Saul on the other, there was a battle between these two sides, during which Abner who was Saul's captain, uh, killed Azahel, who was the brother of Joab, who was David's captain. Okay. So, Abner has killed Azahel. Azahel is the brother of Joab. Joab, therefore, feels he has the right to kill Abner, because Abner has killed his brother Azahel. Now, David is trying, actually, to do a deal with Abner, and invites Abner to visit him, that's David, in, in Hebron, and they work out some sort of arrangement. And as Abner is leaving to go back to where he is, Joab sends a messenger and says, come back, we need to discuss something else. Abner turns back, and at that point, Joab kills him as revenge for the death of Azahel. And David is extremely displeased at this. It has, in a, in a way, scuppered some of his plans for reuniting the, um, the, the, the different factions. 
And David shows his disapproval by attending the funeral of Abner as the chief mourner. And indeed we have uh, an ancient poem in 2 Samuel chapter 3 attributed to David. Uh, 2 Samuel 3, 33. Should Abner die as a fool dies, your hands were not bound, your feet were not fettered. As one falls before the wicked, you have fallen. David is therefore displeased. And then we see later on an attempt to try to, as, as it were, modify this whole business um, of blood revenge and to give it more precision. Um, and I've mentioned in the handout Joshua verse 20, Joshua chapter 20, verses 1 to 9. This is the designation of so-called cities of refuge. Then the Lord said to Joshua, Say to the people of Israel, Appoint cities of refuge, of which I spoke to you through Moses, that the manslayer who kills any person without intent or unwittingly may flee there. They shall be for you a refuge, from the avenger of blood. Now you see, under the, what we might call the primitive law of blood revenge, it doesn't matter how you kill somebody, you shed his blood and that's it. But an example is given in a passage in the Old Testament. Supposing you're on your chopping a tree down, and you haven't tied your axe head very securely onto the shaft, and the axe head falls off uh, and it hits somebody and it kills them, you haven't killed them deliberately. Now, under the, as it were, primitive version of blood revenge, nonetheless, um, someone is still entitled to come and take your life because you've killed him. It, didn't, it doesn't matter that he was unwittingly. And so this is an attempt to make a distinction between deliberate killing and accidental killing. And the person who kills accidentally or unwittingly can flee to a city of refuge. And if he manages to get there before the avenger of blood gets him, he's safe. And then another version of the regulation says that the elders in the city can then judge the case. And if they're convinced by the evidence that this is an innocent piece of, of killing, then he's not guilty. If they think that it is deliberate killing, they will hand him over, the elders will hand him over to the avenger of blood. So we see, first of all, to say this sort of informal social mechanism, and then we see the attempt in ancient Israel to, con to control it, to, con to, to, to refine it. The next one, under 4b, disputes settled between families. We have to envisage here a situation in, in which there, there are villages, perhaps far from um, big towns, um, and in those villages, families, of course, are collections of people. They are households presided over by a male head of house. Um, that is what a, a familia is in Latin. A family is a household. It may include people related to each other by blood, but it also includes other people, servants, can even include, in ancient Israel law, um, uh, domestic animals. That's another, another matter, part of the family. Um, now, supposing there's a dispute between these families, um, then this is settled within the family. And there's an interesting law that I've quoted in 4b, Exodus 21.22, Exodus 21.22, which not only shows you something being regulated within the family, but also then another attempt to integrate this local justice into a more official, comprehensive justice. So I will read out um, Exodus 21, 22 to 25. When men strive together and hurt a woman with child so that there is a miscarriage and yet no harm follows, the one who hurt her shall be fined according as the woman's husband shall lay upon him then listen to the next bit. And he shall pay as the judges determine. Now those words, he shall pay as the judges determine, is an extra piece of drafting. Uh, so, no, this isn't to be decided by the husband. 
this is going to be decided by judges, so the, the, the local thing is taken into a more official thing. If any harm follows, then you shall give life for life, an eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, wound for wound, stripe for stripe. Uh, last week, remember, I, I reminded you about the law of Talion, an eye for an eye, and said that it uh, applied in the book of Deuteronomy to someone who's trying to you know, get somebody falsely accused of something. And the law is that if you're a false witness and you try to get somebody accused of who's innocent um, and, and you're found out, then you will suffer the penalty uh, that the person would have suffered if you'd managed to show that that person was guilty even though they were innocent. And here, this is about damages. And I suppose what we have to envisage is a case in which somehow a woman has got involved um, in a brawl between two men. Uh, she's pregnant, she gets injured, um, she has um, a miscarriage. And then there's the question, well, what do you do? And it would appear that if the miscarriage, um, if, 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 the, if the child is, is born dead, then um, you give life for life. Um, some, some life is forfeit. Um, uh, uh, ditto, if the eye is injured, then it is the eye. Um, although some people have argued that they're not talking about the harm done to the, to, to the fetus, but the harm done um, to, to the woman herself, but, but we won't go into that. But the point is that this is an instance of, of local justice between families, uh, with the husband having the power to uh, decide the fine, and then this extra little clause says, no, it, it, it's not the husband, it's the judges who are going to determine what the fine is. Now the next one, C, is we've moved now to the state where we've got, I suppose, the equivalent of what we would call magistrates. That is sort of lay people who are brought in to decide cases. And of course the most famous example of this is in the book of Ruth, um, chapter 4, verses 1 to 12, where, where you remember that uh, Boaz um, wishes to marry Ruth but she has a nearer relative who has a prior claim um, and he's wanting a proper legal procedure so that the, the relative legally and properly waives his claim um, so that Boaz can go ahead and marry Ruth. So we read in Ruth, for Boaz went up to the gate and sat down there. Now we have to remember that Israelite cities were very small had practically no public spaces apart from the gate where you went in. That was the one public space. And all the important things happened there um, in, that, in, in the gate of the city, the one public space. So Boaz, um, so behold, the next of kin of whom Boaz had spoken came by. This is the person with the prior claim on Ruth. Boaz said, turn aside, friend, sit down here. And he turned and sat down, and he took ten men of the elders of the city and said, sit down here. So they sat down. And then in the presence of those ten men that he has gathered to sit with him in the gate of the city, uh, the, the case is heard um, and tried, um, and um, it, it is publicly witnessed that this nearer kinsman um, doesn't want to marry Ruth, and therefore Boaz has a right to but this is um, justice in the gate, as it is called. And often in the prophets, we get the prophet complaining that you turn aside uh, people from the gate. You, you deny uh, people justice. And then, of course, finally, we come on to, as it were, the, the, the full-blooded uh, administration of justice, the central administration of justice. And this is where we get the contact, contact with the laws that we find in other ancient collections of laws. Because in the court and in the temple, even in the tiny kingdoms of Judah and Israel, it was necessary to have scribes. Um, I mean, that's one reason why we've got um, records from the, of, of, of the kings. And, you know, we're often told, oh, the, the rest of the acts of so-and-so, are they not written in the books of the chronicles of the kings of Israel and Judah? So that the court and the temple were the places where people learned to write. Now, of course, Hebrew was written in an alphabetic script, but diplomacy had to be carried on 
And if you were carrying on diplomacy with the king of Assyria, uh, his court used the cuneiform. So it was necessary that there had to be people at the, at the court, in the temple um, in, in ancient Israel and Judah, um, who were competent um, in the much more complicated cuneiform with its 300 or more signs. And probably these scribes in the Israelite court were, were trained by foreigners. There's some evidence that they imported people from Egypt uh, to, to train the scribes um, in, in Israel um, and Judah. And in the course of this, therefore, part of their training was copying collections of laws and that is one reason why there may be similarities with, therefore between some of these older collections and the ones that we have in the Old Testament so we come on to paragraph 5 and this is in a way all preparation for what I shall be doing in the next three weeks after today um, looking at um, specific collections in Exodus, Deuteronomy, and Leviticus. There is a very important distinction between what we call casuistic or case law and apodictic laws, that is, laws that admit no exception or circumstances. And I give you some examples here, Exodus 21.15 versus Exodus 21.18, which I shall read to you so that you can see the difference. Exodus 21.18 When men quarrel and one strikes the other with a stone or with his fist and the man does not die but keeps his bed then if the man rises again and walks abroad with his staff he that struck him shall be clear only he shall pay for the loss of his time and shall have him thoroughly healed. When a man strikes his slave, male or female, with a rod, and the slave dies under his hand, he shall be punished. But if the slave survives a day or two, he is not punished, for the slave is his money, i.e. his property. So if a man has killed his own slave, it's only a loss to him. Now you can see that there are very specific cases being set out. If, if this happens and this happens and something else follows from it, then you do something. This, this is case law. But compare this with 2118 to, uh, sorry, with um, 2115 to 17. Whoever strikes his father or his mother shall be put to death. Whoever steals a man, that is, a, de deprives a man of his freedom, whether he sells him or is found in possession of him shall be put to death. Whoever curses his father or his mother shall be put to death. So you see this clear distinction between these laws that set out these very special cases on the one hand and these laws that are these broad generalizations. And it doesn't matter. I mean, there, there might be a very good reason for somebody striking his father or mother. I mean, what about self-defense? You know, suppose you, you know, you're, you're, you're being beaten and you try to defend yourself and accidentally you, you strike your father or mother. Are you still liable uh, to the death penalty? Um, and so on. So the apodictic law appears to admit of no exceptions whatsoever. And the point has been made that the first law that I've spoken about, the casuistic law, the case law, does seem to belong to jurisdiction being put into practice within the courts. But the other one that simply says, whoever strikes his father and mother shall be put to death, this is expressing a general principle. Perhaps it is an attempt to... Um, impose sanctions but we're beginning to get there the distinction between law in the sense of the application of particular um, rules and justice in the sense of the enunciation of particular principles of, um, of, of what is right and wrong and this then brings me to my last point uh, to talk about Exodus 21, 1 to 11, because the interesting thing about Exodus 21, 1 to 11 is that you have laws, except that these specify no penalty.
penalty, describe no outcome, but just assume that something is going to be done. When you buy a Hebrew slave, he shall serve six years, and in the seventh he shall go out free for nothing. If he comes in single, that's unmarried, he shall go out single. If he comes in married, then his wife shall go out with him. But if his master gives him a wife, and she bears him sons or daughters, the wife and her children shall be her masters, and he shall go out alone. But if the slave plainly says, I love my master, my wife and my children, I will not go out free, then his master shall bring him to God, perhaps that means to the temple, or possibly the judges, that, that's the traditional Jewish interpretation, bring him to the door or the doorpost, and his master shall bore his ear through with an awl, A-W-L, and he shall serve him for life. So we've got a regulation there, but no penalties are prescribed. It, it, it's not in the form, um, if a master refuses to release his slave after six years, you know, he shall be fined so much, or he shall be punished, or, or whatever. So that something is being enunciated, it is a principle that is, that is being laid down, and it is this point, and this is what I shall be um, elaborating um, in, in the following, three following weeks when I talk about um, Exodus and Deuteronomy and Leviticus, we, we are beginning to get into the realm of theology, because what is being articulated here is, is a principle that has a very deep theological justification. One thing that is quite clear in the Old Testament is that although there is such an institution as slavery, it is abhorrent to God. And on more than one occasion we get God saying, you were slaves in Egypt and I redeemed you from there. And God is saying, look, Perhaps there may be circumstances in which people have got to be slaves, but that must be limited. And God did not deliver his people from slavery in order that they might enslave each other. And we're beginning, therefore, to get into that realm of, of, the, of the theology of the laws, where the laws are meant to begin to reflect the mercy and the graciousness of God. The laws are meant to be what I have described in my work as structures of grace. Ways of arranging social relationships so that people are treated graciously and are able to live graciously. And so I've had my 40 minutes and it's time to stop and I hope I've prepared things satisfactorily for the lectures next week. <laughs>